Would You Like to Travel with What's Her Name podcast? In 2023, we're planning two trips focusing on the lost women of history. In June, we're going to France. And in October, we are going to New England. If either of these sound like your jam, check out our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. We are going to have an amazing time. This episode was sponsored by our patrons, Julie Gray, Rachel Kay, Jessica Smith, Tracy Steeb, Kim Hokinson, Janelise Cannon, Jill Harrigan, Jamie Lang, Maria Sanchez, Heather McKinnon, Valerie Jacobson, Chantel Oliver, Tamzane Weir, and Caitlin McTaggart. Thank you so much for being our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. Merry Christmas, Olivia. Merry Christmas, Katie. Here's the thing that strikes me every Christmas. All the Christmas classic stories are written by men Mm -hmm. about men. Yep. Christmas Carol, Elf, Home Alone. Yeah. And, and especially, okay, so in order to do a reading of a Christmas story, it has to be out of copyright for our purposes. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at pre-1924 Christmas yep. stories. And there... Women didn't exist before 1924. Apparently. <laughs> Such a dearth. Having said that... On a recent visit to England, I was, of course, in the charity shops looking at all of the vintage books. Mm -hmm. And I found a book called, let me grab my copy. Here it is. A Country House Christmas, Treasure Mm. on Earth, a Magical Memoir of an Edwardian Christmas by Phyllis Eleanor Sandeman. And I thought, what? Dare I dream? Could this be true? It really (laughs) is. A memoir written by Phyllis Eleanor Sandeman in the nostalgic Edwardian England pre-World War I, before anybody knew everything was going to fall apart. Mm. And uh, actually, she grew up to be a painter, like an Impressionist painter. Most of her paintings are in private collections, but the one that's digitized that I could find online is her painting of the New Year's Servant's Ball at their grand country house called Lime Park. Wow. Which she painted because that was like her happiest childhood memory is the New Year's Servants Ball. Huh. She went on to write a whole memoir of Christmases at Lime Park when she was a child. Just, it's like a Christmas special of Downton Abbey from a child's perspective. Oh, fun. Is what it is. (laughs) Lime Park, like Lime Regis? Good guess. That's what I thought at first, but no, Lime Park is in Cheshire, up north. Oh. And I wanted to find somebody who could read it and do it justice. Someone, Mm -hmm. ideally, from the north, (laughs) who maybe is a very talented voice actor, plus artist, plus doll maker. Oh, I'm so Uh. excited. (laughs) The very talented and marvelous and wonderful Jay Stelling. Ah, yes. Our guest in our episode, The Witch, Uh. um, she agreed to read excerpts from this book for us. It is a whole big fat book. So listeners, (laughs) if you enjoy this, then click through on the show notes where you can get the whole entire book. Awesome. And to me, this story is about home. It's about feeling linked to a place that you love where you belong. And in the dark of winter, that is a feeling that every human needs. (sighs) So let us escape the angst of the modern era (laughs) and travel to Lime Park on Christmas Eve, 1905. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. In the northern half of England, in a great hilly park bordering on three counties, stands an Elizabethan mansion. Stone built round a central courtyard with a long, almost unbroken frontage and three rows of windows looking down the valley. Great stone buttresses support it on one side where the ground falls steeply and at their feet lies an Italian garden. Behind the house, the ground rises again to the uninhabited moors. One Christmas Eve, Well before the First World War, a fine layer of snow already covered the slopes of the park, and the sky was heavy with more to come. Not far from the house, in a wooded hollow behind a mill pool, deer were feeding from bundles of hay. Passing through this wooded valley, rising in serpentine twists and bends, a carriage drive wound its gradual ascent up to the house, 
but cutting across it, running straight up the steep hillside, a narrow footpath gave a direct approach. Up this, a little girl was climbing. She wore the black stockings and button boots of her generation, an obviously homemade coat and skirt, and a hat secured by an elastic under her chin. It was late afternoon. Rabbits, looking almost black in the fading light, sped to their snowy burrows on either side of the path. A cock pheasant rocketed up almost from the child's feet and made for the cover of the woods. Without pausing, she continued on her way. Excitement was mounting in her as she climbed. So short a time to wait now before the curtain rose on a drama of infinite delight. A gradual crescendo of bliss. Tonight, a large party of visitors was arriving. And from tomorrow, for a whole fortnight, one pleasure would succeed another. There might, if this weather held, be skating, or better still, tobogganing, for which the slopes of the park were so well suited. But the weather did not matter. How could it, with a house full of delightful visitors and such a house to play in? There would be the Christmas tree with all its presents, games in the drawing room, music and dancing in the hall, private theatricals in the long gallery, hide and seek all over the house, with people chasing each other in delicious terror the whole length of the long corridors. Wonderful meals in the dining room, dinners as well as luncheons even for little girls, and all the time everybody, particularly the grown-ups, happy, good-humoured, joking and jolly, ready at any moment to romp and play the fool. This heavenly drama was just due to begin. At the top of the slope, the house was fully revealed. Light shone in some of the windows, glowing warmly behind red blinds. Two small guard houses with barred windows and surmounted by couching lions flanked the wide open gates of the forecourt. The main approach to the house was a continuous ascent to a panorama of distant hills. Above the treetops in the middle distance rose a bare conical hill, its summit crowned by an ancient grey stone tower. Suddenly the air was filled with the clamour of an army of rooks. The whole western slope of the hill was black with these birds, which every evening assembled here and, remaining for a few moments as if in prayer, then dispersed into their roosting places in the lime trees near the house. Still thinking of nothing but the coming delights, the child turned in at the forecourt gates. To her, the house seemed to possess a living soul of its own, and to be now waiting in a state of happiness that matched her own to take the arriving guests into its loving old heart. From a medieval manor standing in a royal forest, each successive generation had left its impress on the place, adding to, altering and embellishing the original structure in lavish expenditure of material means and tender devotion, till it had become what it was now, a palace, but lived in and loved as a home. The big central doorway led straight into the cloistered courtyard round which the house was built. Opposite, across the courtyard, another door led out to the terrace and gardens. But the child was bound for the housekeeper's rooms, a very pleasant place to visit before going upstairs, where a warm welcome was always assured. Now, bursting in as usual, she found her friend Mrs Campbell, in best black dress and lace cap, seated in her chair by the fire. The curtains were drawn and the table laid for tea for at least a dozen people. Mrs Campbell exclaimed at her appearance, "'Good gracious, Miss Phyllis, you've never been out in all this cold in only that thin jacket, and where are your snow boots?' Oh, there's hardly any snow yet. It's all right. I want to find Jim Bowden and ask him to make something for the play. Have you seen him? He's not down at the workshop. I've just come from there. Clicking her tongue, the housekeeper wondered for the hundredth time why Lady Vane, her mistress, did not bother more about the child's clothes. Who would have thought that the parents of this poorly clad little figure were the owners of Vine Park? But it was an age when the children of the upper classes were not, as a rule, much cosseted or even very well dressed. Many children of very rich parents, without much tradition, might be seen disporting themselves in Hyde Park, arrayed like exotic birds in velvets and furs. 
Amongst them flitted the children of the English aristocracy, clothed as if simplicity were not enough, often in shabby, outgrown garments, the discards of their elder brothers and sisters. In the adult world, too, extreme comfort mingled with austerity. Many, of whom Sir Thomas Vane was one, took cold baths throughout the year. Even in the rigorous climate of northern England, short tweed jackets were worn out of doors in winter. Boots lined with lamb's wool were unknown, and fur jackets for children were not approved of, for the cult of the child had not yet set in. Mrs Campbell, however, thought differently, and Phyllis had to repeat her question before she received an answer. Jim, he'll be messing about on the stage in the long gallery, I expect. Come and get warm, dear. You look half perished with cold. I thought they finished putting up the stage this morning. So they did, according to Mr Truelove, but Jim would be there when he's wanted elsewhere. There's a handle off the chest of drawers in the oak room where Mr Blunt's going. And what he'll think, I don't know. Thawing comfortably before the fire, Phyllis pursued her train of thought. I wish Alethea could sleep with me instead of in the tower. It's her ladyship's orders, dear. Phyllis was warm again and ready to go upstairs. Her hat hanging by its elastic on the back of her neck, she paused on her way to the door to survey the decked tea table where a lavish assortment of scones, crumpets, sandwiches, cakes and jams was set out. Do tell Anna not to send up that cherry cake for our tea again today. I hate cherry cake. Can't we have a seed one? You and your old seed cake. There's nobody but you and Sir Thomas ever touches it. The housekeeper was scornful but indulgent. You'd better be quick then and tell Anna at once. Your tea must be just going up. Oh, and as you're going up, dear, ask Sarah to come down and speak to me a minute. She'll be in the housemaid's cupboard. Skipping into the conveniently adjoining still room, Phyllis found Anna, the still room maid, and George, the hall boy, in the act of loading his tray with the schoolroom tea, including the hated cherry cake. Poor George was the servant of the servants, and besides waiting on them, he frequently did their work as well as his own. Mrs Campbell, seated beside her fire, a full coal scuttle within reach, would not hesitate to ring her bell summoning him for his work at the opposite end of the house to make up the fire for her. Yet no ill feeling was aroused. The victim accepted it as being quite in order, for the upper servants had all been through the same mill. Quickly setting them right over the cherry cake, Phyllis proceeded up the back stairs, also conveniently adjoining the still room. In the days of Elizabeth, even service staircases were beautiful. On the top floor, the staircase ended in a long corridor, lit by windows looking onto the central court and running round the three sides of the house. The fourth was occupied by the long gallery. Down this passage, Phyllis hurried, through a door separating the back premises from the grand staircase, and so to the end of the passage and the door of the long gallery, through which came sounds of hammering. A stage had been built at this end of the gallery, and on it, as expected, she found Jim Bowden, the house carpenter, putting the final touches to the woodland scene where the action of the play was set. Seen from the lighted stage, the great length of the dark gallery seemed to stretch away to infinity. To Phyllis it looked a little ghostly and frightening. The walls were covered to within three feet of the ceiling with Tudor panelling. Halfway down the outer wall, the huge chimney piece, stone and gilded plaster, with the arms of Elizabeth in the centre, reached to the ceiling. On either side of this, a row of long, uncurtained windows now showed only a deep purple twilight outside, and the two at the end, looking onto the forecourt, were almost invisible from the stage. Surveying the completed woodland scene, which had been specially painted for the occasion, Phyllis thought it wonderful. The path winding away into the trees on the back cloth looked as if, by a slight effort of will, it could be walked upon. They were doing a gypsy play this year. She was to be the rich young lady in love with a poor young man whom her worldly-minded guardian would not allow her to marry. The gypsies would help to circumvent him and true love triumph in the end. Last year she had been the beautiful village maiden, courted by the wicked duke, her brother Richard, and the virtuous peasant boy, her other brother Piers. At one point in the play, Piers had to say, I am a poor but honest peasant. And the duke, to reply, 
A poor but honest pheasant. I will shoot you, you miserable pheasant. No, you cannot shoot me till October. Of course, the audience had not failed to go into the appropriate roars of laughter. After this, there was to be a highwayman piece in which her mother and Uncle William took the leading roles. Her sister Lettuce was to play opposite Captain Tarpauli, the son of a neighbouring squire. The producer and manager was to be Mr Blunt, who was by no means easy to please and something of a perfectionist. Her father never took part in the acting. Though always ready to acclaim their success, he could be counted on to throw plenty of cold water at the outset. In fact, Sir Thomas Vane either pretended to or really did dislike Christmas and all its festivities, unbelievable as this seemed to his youngest daughter. Phyllis had even noticed a slight tendency on the part of Lettuce and Richard to be a little blasé about it also. Sometimes Richard seemed to forget about this, but if it awoke in her too violent a response, he would very quickly revert to his former mood. She now put her request to Jim, which was that he should make them a sham chicken for the supper scene in the play. Jim Bowden, a small man with a large, drooping moustache, seemed dubious. Mr Truelove says how he thought you could make do with a real one, he replied at last. At this moment the door to the far end of the gallery started to creak open, and gradually emerging from the darkness into the rays of the footlights, a group of men appeared bearing a large fir tree. Slowly and carefully they advanced, accompanied by a tall commanding figure, which took no share of the burden, but directed them at every step. That will do, thank you. True love, for it was he, dismissed the gardeners and turned to Phyllis, who had left the stage to inspect the tree. It would have been hard to find a more perfect butler than True love. He was tall, but not quite so tall as his footman, and that was as it should be. Immaculate in appearance, Rigidly upright, quiet, dignified, confident, there was one thing about him that was unconventional and surprising in a butler. His upper lip was closely shaved, but his lower jaw was covered by a grey growth, perfectly kept and trimmed, and not unlike King Edward's, but still a beard. There was a rumour that True Love had a delicate throat which must be protected, but the more probable explanation was that it placed him above the general level, gave him a particular cachet. A nice tree, don't you think, miss? He now remarked to Phyllis. Oh, yes, but it's not quite such a good shape as last year's. Ah, wait well, till I've tied on a few extra branches. Jim, come over here, please. I want you. And taking the hint, Phyllis left to get ready for tea. When ready for tea, Phyllis passed into the adjoining schoolroom, where she found both her German governess and tea waiting. Fräulein Thur, who only left her pupils during the summer holidays, was rather remarkable in that she spoke German, French and English almost equally well. Rigidly conscientious, she never allowed a word of English to pass between her and her pupils except during the Christmas holidays or when visitors were present. She and Phyllis spent most of their time together and got on well, for Fräulein Thur, in spite of her protest that she was always called Fräulein, had a kind heart. She was rather elderly, and summer or winter never wore anything but black. Above her broad Dutch doll's face, her greying hair was arranged in two conical puffs, rising like twin volcanoes from a centre parting. Neighbours kind, where have you been since you left me? she asked. I saw your father in the garden. He was looking for you to go with him to feed the ducks. Sir Thomas had an almost passionate love for birds. Rare and decorative waterfowl, teal, widgeon, pintail and gorgeous mandarins grace the ornamental lake. Demoiselle and crested cranes from South America and gold and silver pheasants haunted the glades of the wood and water garden and a peculiar species of ostrich, a rather bad-tempered pair, stalked the lime avenue at the back of the house. The climate was too severe to allow many of these creatures to breed. But if any of them ever did produce offspring, there was great rejoicing and corresponding black gloom if they did not survive. Phyllis thought secretly that her father's love of birds was the real reason why he never now made one of the guns at a shoot. Rather ironically, though born to great possessions, he was a man of simple tastes and unconventional ideas for whom life in the grand manner had no appeal. 
He carried his dislike of any kind of display or vulgarity to such lengths that his wife once said to him that he would be content to dress in rags if it would not make him too conspicuous. More far-seeing than many, he often said places like Vine were an incubus and to live in them was a mistake. Life in a villa by the sea would be infinitely preferable and in fact he predicted most of them would so be living before they were much older. To Lettuce, who in London was not allowed out walking unaccompanied, he had said, You ought to be going out in buses alone. He much preferred parlour maids to great stupid louts of footmen and would have liked to introduce them at Vine. But Lady Vane did not share these views. She was quite determined that neither should Lettuce frequent buses, with or without her maid, nor parlour maids be seen whisking their streamers and aprons about the stately rooms of Vine. She had no yearnings for villa life, whether by the sea or elsewhere. Vine was what she wanted, and she loved it with a wholehearted, almost passionate devotion. Phyllis, who felt just the same as her mother about their home, was sometimes troubled by a question she longed to put, but was doubtful if anybody knew the answer. The question was, when, as she hoped, one at last reached heaven, would one find Vine there? She had no doubt whatever of what her mother would reply. It would be yes, most decidedly. In fact, Phyllis knew that for her mother, heaven was unimaginable without Vine. But did her mother really know? Fräulein, she also had no doubt, would reply differently. Life in heaven would far transcend any earthly form of happiness. But if it were possible, on that plane, to experience pleasure in things and places as on earth, then they would be more like the things and places in Germany. Canon Waldegrave, their parish priest, Phyllis felt ought to know, but she was far too shy to ask him, so the question remained unanswered. Back in her own room, she scrambled into a muslin frock and tied the sash as best as she could, which was not very well. Drawing aside one of the blinds, Phyllis looked out into the dark courtyard. The window in the gatehouse with its small diamond-shaped panes and behind them which John the hall porter slept was lit. It showed a white, even expanse of newly fallen snow completely covering the flags of the courtyard. That was as it should be, a white Christmas. When the curtain went up at the given moment, it would be on the perfect Christmas scene. Phyllis knew the exact moment when the curtain would rise. Not when she first woke in the morning and felt for the bulges in the stocking at the foot of her bed. It was a little later when the strains of Christmas Awake, sung by the carol singers in the courtyard below, penetrated to her bedroom. The reception of these carol singers was the only part of the Christmas festivities which seemed to be not quite perfect. They were not the ordinary waits out to receive alms, but members of the unusually well-trained choir from the village church, whose organist and choirmaster happened to be a skilled musician. In the still air of early morning from the enclosed courtyard, their voices soared sweet, true and clear. Yet, strangely enough, no one seemed to appreciate their performance, nor the fact that they had climbed two miles of continuously rising ground from the park gates in the frost and snow of winter to sing to the occupants of the great house. What was more, having sung, they would have to tramp back again. Phyllis felt rather ashamed that up till now she had never bothered to find out when or where they were given refreshment. It was not after their singing, for she had seen them walking away from the seemingly still sleeping house. But it was rather strange. She now thought for the first time she could not recall either of her parents ever mentioning them, for they were the overture of the Christmas drama. She might, if she had been older, have remembered it is the fate of most overtures to be disregarded. Down the back stairs she sped, through the door, into the first floor corridor, turned right, then left, then down the short flight of stairs which brought her to the hall. Some of the lights were already on and two card tables were set out in the central space under the chandelier. Two large Chippendale sofas faced each other at right angles to the fire. Behind one of them was the grand piano. 
She stood between two of the giant pillars and recollections of Christmas crowded upon her as she surveyed the scene. Boisterous fooling, small drolleries, trivial actions, expressions of light-hearted joy, all contributing to form the dazzling pattern of delight which the word Christmas conveyed in her mind. Last New Year's Eve, she had stood here, with Hilda and Alethea, the boys and Uncle Andrew, examining the cleared floor, just before the ball, standing under the chandelier, joking about the absence of mistletoe. Suddenly, someone behind her, she did not know who, but probably Richard, had lifted her up till her face was on a level with Uncle Andrew's, who of course kissed her. Undoubtedly, the peak of enjoyment was reached on New Year's Eve. Thereafter, there would be the three glorious evenings of the theatricals, but they were overshadowed by the impending breakup of the house party and the return to normal routine. She wondered what games they would play tonight. Perhaps they would not play games, and instead, Cousin Amy would give them a little music. She played music of the lighter kind charmingly. Strauss and Lahar, bits of Veronique and Offenbach's Barcarolle. All music sounded well in the hall, even the most mediocre. But when, on rare occasions, beauty of composition was matched by its performance, the sensitive listener might fancy a strange quickening of the atmosphere. As if the figures in the tapestry stirred with life, the very flowers in their vases trembled with yearning and delight. Yes, thought Phyllis, it all looked lovely. Now she would have just one peep at her favourite room, and then she must really be off to bed. Leaving the hall by the opposite side from which she had entered, she mounted the corresponding short flight of stairs which led to the drawing room. Cautiously, she opened the door in case by chance Grandmama should already be installed there. But no, there was nobody in the room, which was lit only by firelight. It leapt over the bosses of the ceiling and through inky shadows from the high reliefs of the plaster frieze, drew gleams of gold from the baskets of fruit and the Chippendale mirrors of the wall. It lit the polished shoulders of the Chinese goddesses, but the stained glass window showed only as dim oblongs in the darkness of the bay. As she crossed the room to the fireplace, a shadowy reflection of herself crossed the room in the mirrors between the windows on the front of the house. She wanted to sit for just a while in this room, which she loved so well, this rich old treasure house of a room. With its spicy aromatic smell, the leaping firelight and darting black shadows. She was a child who suffered from night fears. Stories of ghosts and witches so delightful in cheerful company returned to trouble her when alone in the dark. It was impossible to ever feel fear in the drawing room. There could surely never be a room more conductive to peace of mind. But the long gallery, so enchanting a playground, could be a little frightening at night, and generally Phyllis avoided going there alone after dark. One night last summer holidays, however, resentful and unhappy from what she considered an unjust rebuke from her parents, she had run there and, flinging herself on one of the deep window seats, burst into tears of self-pity. The full moon was flooding into the gallery and the floor was barred with long rectangles of light cast from each uncurtained window. They lay in diminishing perspective down the whole great length of the room, completely changing its familiar aspect and the effect, though beautiful, was weird and unearthly. But for once, Phyllis's sense of woe was stronger than her fears of the supernatural. She sat in the full flood of the moonlight and wept with that complete abandonment to grief of, out of all proportion to the cause, which only children are capable. Nobody loved her. Her parents misjudged her. They expected too much. Her most innocent words, devoid of any intention to offend, were taken the wrong way. She was misunderstood, lonely, desolate and oppressed. But almost at once, breaking in upon grief with a gentle but increasing pressure, she seemed to detect a sympathy in the surrounding atmosphere, as if unseen presences thronging about her were offering their love and consolation. She thought that there were many present, 
but felt neither surprise nor fear. Why else had she come to be alone and apart in this dark, mysterious old room, if not to seek and find comfort? After only a little while, grateful and happy again, she went to her room and so to sleep. Meantime, of course, she must not sit too long in the drawing room. Withers, whose duty it was, would soon be coming to turn on the lights and see that everything was in order. And then Grandmama, after her little dinner in her room, would come in on the arm of her maid to take up her place on the sofa by the fire. Grandmama too suffered from nervous fears, not of the supernatural, but of flesh and blood burglars. She could hardly be left a moment alone on account of this. One morning last holidays, Phyllis, forgetting that Grandmama had been allotted the room, usually given to Cousin Amy, had rapped loudly on the door and rattled the door handle. She was coming to fetch Cousin Amy for a walk. But the door was locked, and instead of the cheerful voice she expected, to her dismay, Grandmama and her mother had replied, calling to whoever it might be, to come round the dressing room door where the maid slept and state his or her business. Instead of doing so, Phyllis took to her heels go round and explain her foolish mistake, not she. And later at luncheon, she listened in guilty silence as her mother recounted the episode. Poor dear Mama, she really is quite obsessed by this fear of burglars. Just now, while I was sitting with her, someone knocked on the door, but didn't come round to the dressing room, though we had told them. Then I noticed Mama was feverishly keeping me in the conversation till Wright would be back from her lunch. And at last she confessed she was afraid that the person who had knocked was a burglar. But the door's well locked, they can't get in, she said. Sir Thomas remarked caustically that he didn't know how burglars were in the habit of knocking loudly on bedroom doors before entering to do their burglaring. And there, to Phyllis's great relief, the matter ended. It was very still in the drawing room. The clock ticked, the coals stirred in the grate, but no sound came from the nearby dining room, where by now they must be in the middle of dinner. Sitting, looking up at the arms of Elizabeth over the chimney piece with the golden lion and the brown griffin, Phyllis thought, How wonderful that in all the wild world there should be a me, a person called Phyllis Vane. She could never get used to the wonder of personal identity. It was even more wonderful than having Vine for a home. But supposing her father's prophecies were fulfilled, if a day should come when they would have to abandon Vine, oh, if that should happen, how could she bear it? But these unwelcome thoughts and fears were only fleeting. Fear of the future, remote possibilities could not long trouble her, secure in her glorious golden present. The present was so full and vital, it was impossible to imagine that it would not endure forever. She jumped up, flinging her arms into the air for joy. The fire leapt and crackled. The needlework-covered chairs drawn up round it waited for their occupants. There was such an air of happy expectancy about the old room that it stirred Phyllis's heart. Did it rejoice in being used, she wondered, just as it had been used by all those people, now long gone, her forebearers, who had made it what it was. Oh, thought Phyllis, giving it a last look round, how I love you, and fancied she caught a soundless response. Love me, love me, for I love you too. As she turned to go, the old English clock on the table by the door struck the half hour then started to chime a Jacobite air. Wrapped with happiness, pleasure in the present beauty of the scene, anticipation of the joy which the morning would bring, the child waited till the tiny melody was over. Then lifted her hand, half in farewell, half in unconscious benediction. Lovely, beautiful room, good night.
There, said Louisa, and gave a final twist to each curl paper on her head. Now hurry up and get to bed, and don't forget your teeth. You must be asleep, you know, before Santa Claus comes. Don't say that! Papa hates it! Well, Father Christmas, then. After Louisa left her, Phyllis sat for a while in the old plush-covered armchair by the fire. Her red-curtained bed waited invitingly with the sheet turned down. She had placed it along the walls so that the curtains spread over her head and foot gave it a tent-like appearance. Her stocking hung at the bed foot, a traditional rite to be observed, though it was never filled with anything more exciting than nuts, almond and raisins, sweets and tangerines. Fräulein was playing Wagner's fire music in the adjoining schoolroom. Phyllis liked to hear it after she had gone to bed. The sound of the piano was friendly and comforting if her night fears were upon her. She wondered whether Alethea was asleep by now, or lying awake joyfully anticipating the morrow. It must be wonderful to be Alethea, but if by some magic they could exchange personalities, she knew that she would never do so. Tomorrow she would be moving in a maze of enchantment through the drama dance of Christmas, that drama in which the setting played so great a part. Waking in the twilight of the winter's morning, waiting for the singing in the courtyard, the herald of the day's delights, breakfast and the exchange of small gifts, the visit to her parents' rooms together with her brothers and sisters to give them their joint offerings, then the drive down through the white park to the old church, the familiar Christmas service, and it came to pass in those days that there went out to a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. A very short sermon from Mr Hunt and the lovely Christmas hymns. Home again for luncheon, with the table stretching almost the whole length of the big room. The boar's head on the sideboard. The joking and fooling in the library. <laughs> then out of doors for a little exercise. Snowballing, perhaps, if there was enough snow. Then in again to change for tea in the dining room with lovely iced cakes and crackers. And then the joyous chattering throng climbing the stairs to the long gallery. And there would stand the great shimmering blazing tree, the only light in the room except the fire, and beside the bran tub, so full that some of the packages were not quite submerged. And beyond the radius of the tree's light, the great long room stretching away into the shadows. They would begin by drawing out the presents one at a time. Phyllis, with love from Papa and Mama. Alethea, with love from Uncle Tom and Aunt Evie. But very soon the tempo would quicken, till they were all putting them out together. It would seem to go on for ages. And then there was the almost equal delight of examining one's own, and other people's presents, and playing with them. And then the little pause before it was time to get ready for dinner. There seemed no end to the delights, and all the time, and independent of all this, that strange, indescribable feeling in the air, which only came at Christmas. Oh, heaven, heaven, thought Phyllis, getting ready for bed. One day, and this was hard to believe, she would be an old woman, and would have to die. One hoped at death to go to one's true home. She was past the stage when one verse in the hymn, There's a friend for little children, evoked visions of gold crowns kept in the nursery cupboard. Nana, can I wear my crown this morning? Life in heaven must be life at vine, with all the high spots and delight eternally repeated and prolonged, with all the people she knew and loved around her, and God the sun sometimes coming over the moors to visit them walking on the water. Phyllis resolved to be up and waiting for the carol singers when they came in the morning. Were they not the herald angels of whom they would afterwards be singing in the church? The overture of the Christmas drama? The bringers of the glad tidings of great joy? There was not long to wait now before the drama would begin. The curtain was trembling to its rise. The twilight of the early winter morning. The piercing sweetness of the voices rising in the still air. The tune of the words she loved so well. Christians, awake, salute the happy morn. Then heaven would open.
Special thanks to Jay Stelling for this reading of A Country House Christmas. And thanks also to Dr. Kira Zeman Rugen, who recorded for us Christians Awake very last minute. And thanks to the National Trust Property Lime Park, which you can still visit in Cheshire. Check out our website, whatshernamepodcast.com, where you can find a copy of the book, as well as links to paintings and artifacts at the house. Music for this episode was provided by an antique music box, Nate Blaze, Fiddlesticks, Brian Bulger, Esther Abrami, Sir Cubworth, and Aaron Kenny. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post all kinds of additional content each week. Our interns are Katie Boucher and Livia Follet. Yes, their names are Katie and Livia. Wishing you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from What's Her Name podcast. Thanks for donating. Thanks for listening. <laughs>